So yesterday, uh, or last time, we talked about uh, the ionic compounds and metals and how their bonding looks. Today we're going to look a little bit differently, and it's going to be more on the covalent compounds. To talk about them, we need to talk about uh, a, one historical person, and that's the Lewis. G.N. Lewis noted that the noble gases were very stable, and that makes sense because they have what's called an octet, meaning they have eight valence electrons, with the exception of helium. And that's because helium, to have its full outer shell, means that it actually has uh, only two, because it only has that one shell for it. Now, this begins the idea of the octet rule, meaning that atoms are going to either lose, gain, or share to achieve eight electrons in their valence shell. With the exceptions of hydrogen and helium, because hydrogen and helium are only have that one S energy level, and therefore the highest that they can go is two uh, electrons in that 1s shell. Whereas everything else beyond that, we're going to go the other way. Now, some might even say that the lithium um, is not going to uh, be in that part of it. And so because they in lithium and beryllium are only would only lose electrons and so they kind of would be in that exception but they don't formally say that that is the exception that they have for it so they can be acquired either by donating or uh, meaning becoming a cation forming that positive charge accepting them being an anion or sharing them becoming the uh covalent compound that they are these can and this is going to be that driving force that everything is going to be based on this gain lose uh, or whatever they need to do to achieve this octet some will do this easier than others and so they um, we'll find that, uh, it's a little bit, it's just, it's a little crazier when it comes to the sharing. And that's why I think we talk more about it. The, it becomes much more complex. It is very simple in that a gain or lose, you would think, but the, how those structures are formed and how they operate is fairly complex. And that's why we don't really talk about them very much. Um, even though we'll uh, look at them again and again and again um, to try and get more in that going. And so we'll have that driving force to be the octet rule um, as we move forward. Everything is trying to get that. Um, and that just becomes the, does it have eight? There are going to be more exceptions to the octet rule as we continue further on. Um, and that's just going to happen, unfortunately. Um, but it is, uh, but that's because that's the nature of chemistry. It's like, you know, if all we gave you was just the regular stuff, the chemistry class would be pretty short. It's, it's trying to in, add and make sense of all the exceptions in chemistry that really just make life a very interesting uh, for us. So, Lewis dot structures. Um, I don't know if this is going to be the same method that some have done and or others do. Uh, this is the method or the order in which I like to uh, talk about the Lewis dot structures. The order that I like to have them uh, looked at uh, just for my way of doing it. And this is just because this is how I have done it for many years. And I have seen students have success with it over many years. And that's ultimately what we're tr really, truly trying to look at. The first step is writing the symbol for, say, that element. 
and that represents the core of the atom. If you had a good time with bore structures, this is going to be probably right up your alley. And the next thing you're going to do is determine the number of valence electrons for that element. Now, if you remember, that number of valence electrons is usually going to be based on the group that it is in the uh, on the periodic table. So group one would have one valence electron. Group two has two valence electrons. Group 13 has 3, group 14 has 4, 15 has 5, and so on and so forth. We draw one dot for every valence electron. By convention, this means that they are placed on the right and then added in a counterclockwise direction. Now, some people look at this going, well, I don't know what a counterclockwise direction is. Well, anyone who's ever played baseball, ran track, or watched NASCAR or even ran uh, or played uh, softball would should know what counterclockwise is because that's the route that you take to go around the bases that's the route that you take to go around the track uh whether that be on in uh athletic track or nascar that's the route that they take and so it's the counterclockwise or if you actually have to look at a clock look at a clock and then see the direction that the hands are moving and go opposite of that. The second dot goes above the symbol and so on and so forth. So kind of in a way we can look at that with a, in a, a very simple example and say that of maybe carbon. Carbon is in group 14 and therefore is going to only have four valence electrons. We place the first one right there. I don't like that color right there, so we'll erase that. It has one dot right there. The next dot for it goes on the top. In a counterclockwise direction, meaning the next one would go here, and the fifth one, or the fourth one, would go there. So it kind of becomes, surrounds it. Now, if we look at, say, the Carbon's uh, Bohr model, and we had, and drew our orbits, we would start to notice something and that the outside ring, the number of electrons in that outside ring are a lot of times going to be the number of dots in a Lewis dot structure. Now, valence electrons only work with the s and p orbitals. So we kind of will ignore any of them that might have the d orbitals. But a lot of times, if we remember, the d orbitals are going to be 1 minus that outside ring. So it actually would even still be allowed to use that for the most part. Now, let's look at one that's a more hypothetical and say, hmm, pedarium. Now, we'll use for the simple fact and say maybe pedarium has, ooh, I don't know, let's say pedarium has seven valence electrons. Well, we would look at carbon and start putting our dots. Now, this is another thing that a lot of times students are bothered by is you'll notice that I inherently already give space for the second dot so that the dots look as if they are equally spaced out. That's done because of practice and practice and practice and practice and having drawn a plethora of 
Lewis dot structures, and I am inherently going to just know that some of these are going to have uh, more than one dot and where those dots are going to go already. So sometimes that bothers students. Well, how do you know to give space in one place and not into another? It just so happens that it's just practice. Okay, now why did I put them in that way? And it kind of, in a way, almost looks like a box. You know, it kind of goes in around in a square box. It does not have in this manner. And a lot of times I've seen students do this at the beginning and kind of use it. Uh, and they, I look, say that that looks like the crosshairs. This is wrong. We do not use, that's wrong, okay? It might make sense for some of the bonding, but the blue one here, this is right. Green checks, this is good. It's the good stuff right there, okay? I almost wanted to make it a box. We'll get into the bonding stuff here in a little bit and it'll make sense why we do it that way. So let's try out some other ones, ones that are actually on the periodic table. So for example, let's look at nitrogen first. The symbol for nitrogen is N. I'll rewrite it so it's a little bit easier for us to see. Okay. And how many dots does it get? Well, we have to look on our periodic table and on our periodic table, we will see that nitrogen is in group 15. Because it's in group 15, it has five dots. And again, I'm going to inherently know where some of these dots are going to go and leave them space. For oxygen, it's going to be very similar. Nothing really changes much. Still oxygen. It's in group 16. Therefore, it's going to have six dots around it. And therefore, we have it done that way. Now, drawing some of these Lewis dot structures is going to be very, very important moving forward when we start bonding them and making them into compounds because of the sharing and some of the why they have certain shapes or why they look the way they do is based on these Lewis dot structures. And so... In some ways, I say it's a matter of life and death be, to know how to uh, draw these Lewis dot structures out. Because if you draw the Lewis dot structure out for oxygen correctly, you should never draw the uh, Lewis dot structure or the bond for water incorrectly. And if you draw the bonds of water incorrectly, you are drawing it in a way that it would not allow for life to exist. So drawing your Lewis dot structures literally is drawing your compounds in a way that could either allow life to happen as it does or not allow life to happen um, as a lot of times students draw it wrong. So life or death. Not, not, not to just, you know, say that it's just for not. It's, it's, it's a big deal. So for fluorine, it's in group 17. It's going to have seven valence electrons. And a lot of times people start going, okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You start getting a little bit used to where you put them. You can put them in, the, in a circle, say that you have six, and then kind of go and rotate around again. That works, whatever you need to do for that. Now, bonding, okay, because just drawing Lewis dot structures usually not all that hard. 
combining them is the where things can become a little difficult. So the more electrons they have, the metals and things like that, they get to be weird, okay? Um, and that's why a lot of times we won't draw out Lewis dot structures for them. If we do, we kind of are usually told what their valence number is. Um, and because there's a gaining and losing. So when we make these compounds, they have a sharing of them. Now, I like the, be, the ability to utilize the technology that we do to allow us to use color to show which ones are being shared. And in, and in case if it, we need to with the uh, ionic compounds, which ones come from which one. So you kind of use colors to help us see how that works. And that really is, uh, I think, elevated uh, students understanding of doing that is using some color so that that visual representation uh, of what electrons are come from what uh, atom are very important. The alternative for these is to kind of sharing and so we're going to look at a sharing of this is kind of a nice little introduction to it and the sharing of chlorine. Now when we look at this you're going to look at the chlorine atom that I have is set up as the example, and you're going to think to yourself, well, wait a second, didn't the uh, Lewis dot structure for fluorine look something like this? How does chlorine look like that? Well, what happens is that sometimes, because writing our letters... Uh, upside down might be a little difficult or in some cases writing our letters on its side might make that letter look like another letter so to release us from some confusion what we're able to do in some cases is we're able to take all of those electrons and just rotate them around so that they match up Think of it as a uh, pieces of a puzzle. When you open up a puzzle and dump it out on the table, sometimes you have to flip the pieces so that the picture's upright. Now, if you're one of those pe weird people that does a puzzle upside down, that works too. That's a challenge in case you're wondering. But if sometimes you have to rotate the puzzle pieces around so that they match up with another piece and match up correctly with another piece. And that's really what we're doing is we're not changing anything in that fluorine or chlorine can have a number of different Lewis dot structures because all we have done is just rotated where they are located around. The pairs are still there. The ones that are that don't have a friend or are unpaired, they are still in that same by themselves. We just rotate them around so that we can match them up as like we are putting together a puzzle. And that's really what I think putting these early bonds, covalent bonds together is like putting together a puzzle. And we can take our uh, things here and try to put our puzzle together. If I try to take this and put it in, I would have to rotate it around. Well, that doesn't look really nice, that upside down F. Well, of course it doesn't. And so what we do is we take it and just rotate the electrons around. And I'm going to use a different color in this case to see. So we just rotate those electrons around so that the pieces match up. 
it could be the example that I start with here is chlorine, but fluorine works the same way as well because fluorine and chlorine, both diatomic, both have seven valence electrons and it doesn't matter. I just kind of started talking about fluorine because that's the one that we had on the previous slide. So when we see here, we have some important electrons and some new terms. And that is the bonding electrons and the non-bonding electrons. The bonding electrons are actively being shared. The non-bonding electrons are not actively bonded. They're not bonding, non-bonded. We do have to be very, very careful though on how we say some of these. Because the unshared pairs are also called lone pairs and they're also non the non-bonding electrons. So when I say how many electrons are non-bonding for, for chlorine, for either chlorine atom, we would say six non-bonding. Well, six non-bonding would mean that we have three pairs of unshared electrons or three lone pairs. And you can start becoming into that philosophical debate of why is it called a pair of pants when there's only one of them? Or why do they call a driveway a driveway when you only park on it and a parkway is driven on? Those philosophical debates of why are they called those certain things? Or a pair of glasses is really only just one set of glasses. So we do have to be very careful about some of the wordage and that is being used. And that's where we I've seen students get dinged um, on homework is because the word says something and it's the bonding pairs. And therefore, you think bonding electrons and you would say two, but it's a bonding pair is one in this case. So we have a bonding pair in the center here. This bonding pair of electrons means one bonding or one bond. Even though there are two electrons in a pair of electrons. And so it's it is there and we do have to be very careful about how we say these things.